Kira, Robert McLaughlin here, 162204, Week 9, Lecture 2. Today we're going to look at phase portraits. Now this is a um, deceptively simple idea. It's a way of drawing all the solutions of a differential equation. In particular, we'll do it for one and two-dimensional systems, both linear systems and nonlinear systems. But it's a very simple but powerful idea. It was introduced maybe at the end of the 19th century. Uh, and it, in the course of the 20th century, it really changed the understanding of differential equations quite a lot, even though, it's, as we'll see this week, it's a very simple idea. We've seen the first example already in one dimension. So suppose I have uh, x prime equals f of x, and let's take a simple example, uh, x minus x cubed. Well, that is equal to x1 minus x 1 plus x, so I see that there are fixed points when x is 0, 1, or minus 1. And if I graph that function, x minus x cubed, it looks like this. There are its three zeros. So the phase portrait is just the real line, and I draw all the orbits on it. There's an orbit at 0, which is just a dot because it's a fixed point. There's an orbit at 1, which is just a dot because it's a fixed point, and minus 1. And I see from here that when x is, lies between 0 and 1, dx dt is positive, which means I'm moving to the right. When x is bigger than 1, dx dt is negative, which means I'm moving to the left. When x is between minus 1 and 1, dx dt is negative. And when x is less than minus 1, dx dt is positive. So from that simple analysis, I get a drawing of all the orbits how, and you just have to imagine how those points will slide along those lines, slide along that line, which is the phase space. Now, you're, when, once we've done the planar case, the two-dimensional case, and you come back to this, then you'll see how it all fits together. So when, in the course of today and tomorrow, we're going to draw phase portraits for linear systems where x lies in R2, and R2 here is going to be called the phase plane. is also called the phase space. So what is this phase plane? It's going to be a, get a diagram like this with x1 and x2. That's my plane. And for any initial condition, you could solve the differential equation, or just imagine you have solved it. You'd get a curve x of t. And if you plot that in the plane, you'd get some parametric curve like that. If you did that for a different initial condition, you'd get a different curve. Each initial condition will lead to a different solution. And altogether, you get a whole family of curves that will fill out the plane. And that collection of curves, the collection of all orbits drawn as parametric curves in the plane, is called the phase portrait. I've drawn them as if I started at t equals 0 and then continued for t positive, but of course you could draw, draw the solution for all t, and you get curves throughout the plane. Now these curves can't cross because at any one point, because, it, a unique, because I have a unique solution to that initial value problem, I can only get one curve emanating from each point. Solution curves. cannot intersect. So this kind of picture, this phase portrait, this gives you a way of visualizing all solutions, not just one solution, and in particular how all the different solutions fit together. And it tells you qualitatively how the solutions to that differential equation behave. So let's do some examples. We'll build up the different possible cases just by considering examples in the plane. So here's a two-dimensional linear system with coefficient matrix 2, 3, 2, 1. Now just imagine you've gone away and you've solved this. That means you've found the eigenvalues. They come out to be negative 1 and 4. For each eigenvalue, you find the eigenvector, and we're assuming that that's done. Now I want to take this formula for the general solution, depending on two parameters, c1 and c2, and draw the phase portrait.
Well, what's a nice easy solution? Suppose c2 is 0, and then my solution is c1 times the vector 1 minus 1 times e to the minus t. That means as t varies, it's always pointing in the direction of the vector 1 minus 1. So I'll draw that first. Okay, the vector 1 minus 1 is 1 along, 1 down. If c1 and c2 are both 0, then my solution is just 0, so I draw a point there, that's a fixed point. That's a steady state, x equals 0 for all t. If c1 is positive, I'd be on the bottom right corner there, so I can draw an arrow, meaning I'm moving... No, I don't, I've drawn my arrow the wrong way. If c1 is positive, as t increases, I move towards 0. Draw my arrow that way. If c1 is negative, as t increases, I still move towards 0, but starting in this direction. So these are the orbits everywhere on this diagonal line. These are the orbits with c2 equals 0. Now I'll do the other eigenvector. If c1 is 0, then I'm always going to lie on the line 3 in, in the direction 3, 2. 3 along and 2 up. Try and draw that line. Looks like that. If c2 is positive, I'm going to lie in the first quadrant, and as t increases, the e to the 4t term will move to infinity. If c2 is negative, I'm going to move off to neg infinity in that direction. So those are very simple solutions, the ones that always point in the direction of an eigenvector. Notice that I don't get the speed, I don't get the fact that it's actually increasing its speed exponentially fast along that line, or the ones when c2 is 0, I can tell that I have to go slower and slower and slower because I'm tending to 0. So that part is taken as red. This is the one with c1 equals 0. Now what if um, c1 and c2 are both positive? That means I have a linear combination of these vectors. And the way to draw this curve, it would be hard to draw it exactly, but I can get a rough idea what it looks like, is to consider what happens when t tends to plus and minus infinity. So imagine c1 and c2 are positive. As t tends to infinity, the second term dominates, because the e to the 4t is tending to infinity, while the e to the minus t is tending to 0. So I must end up pointing in the direction 3, 2. As t tends to minus infinity, this term is going to dominate, because that's going to be e to a larger and larger positive number, while this term is going to tend to 0. So altogether, my solution curve when c2, c1 and c2 are positive must look like this. And the other solutions for different values of c1 and c2 are all going to fit in, in a similar way. But they're all going to have the same asymptotic properties. When t tends to infinity, they'll end up pointing in the direction 3, 2. When t tends to minus infinity, they'll be pointing in the direction 1, minus 1. Now, from now on, it's pretty easy to fill in the other orbits, because they must more or less line up with those arrows. There we go. So there's the complete phase border of that system, and that gives you a much better picture of the different types of orbits and how they fit together than just the formula for the solution. In addition, whenever you have one positive eigenvalue and one negative eigenvalue, then the phase portrait is always going to look very similar to this picture. The only thing that can change is the relative orientation of those axes there, the eigenvector axes. Okay, let's do another one. Oh, I didn't even need this blank paper. So let's... Okay, let's draw the phase portrait of this 2x2 two two linear system. Coefficient matrix is minus 2, 2, 1, negative 3. Uh, it has two eigenvalues which are distinct and real. One of them is negative 1, one of them is negative 4. And here we've skipped the step where you actually work out the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors, and we'll just take that general solution to the differential equation as red, and we want to draw the phase portrait. 
First I'll draw the solution with um, C2 equals zero. So just the first component there. And you notice that when C2 is zero, it's always pointing in the direction two, one, the eigenvector that goes with it. So two along and one up. So that's always going to be lying on that line. If C1 was, try that again. That's the fixed point at the origin. If C1 was positive, I'd be on this side and I would, as t increases, I would be tending towards zero because e to the minus t tends to zero as t tends to infinity. If C1 was negative, I'd be on this side and again tending to zero. So the picture so far has got three separate solutions. The fixed point, zero. Another solution that tends to zero from the right and a third solution that tends to zero from the left. Now I'll draw the solution that goes with the other eigenvector. It's in the direction 1, negative 1. And that solution, when C1 is 0, always points in that direction, and it goes to 0 even more rapidly, like e to the minus 40. So I might be able to draw a double arrow there to say it's really going in much faster towards 0 along that. Now the question ha is, what happens to the other solutions that have both C1 and C2 non-zero? So suppose C1 and C2 are positive. Then I'm going to have a combination of these two. And the question is, which is the most important? Well, as t tends to infinity, the e to the minus 40 term is going to go to zero much faster than the e to the minus t. So as t tends to infinity, I'll end up pointing in the direction 2, 1. So I'll come in like this tangent to that direction. But as t tends to minus infinity, I'm going to be coming in from infinity and now I'll be in the direction 1 minus 1 because the e to the minus 4t term will be much bigger. So I get a solution that looks like that. And then in the other four quadrants, it's the same. We're just getting a rough idea here. But that's the phase portrait for two real negative eigenvalues that are distinct. This is a sink. All orbits tend to zero as t tends to infinity. The fixed point at the origin is stable. So to sum up, we haven't done every possible case of a 2 by 2 linear system, but we've done a lot of them. We've done the cases when the eigenvalues are real and distinct. The different possibilities are, uh, if they're both positive, then we have a source. And the fixed point at the origin is unstable. If both eigenvalues are negative, we have a sink. And the fixed point at the origin is stable. If one eigenvalue is negative and one is positive, we have a saddle. It's got, in a way, it's got the most, that is still unstable, but it's got the most interesting phase portrait. Like that, move along that direction, fall in along that direction. Uh, and there are two more cases that I haven't actually done in detail here, but you can look them up in the study guide. They're the degenerate cases when one eigenvalue is zero. This would be called a degenerate source, and this one would be a degenerate sink. Their face portraits look a bit like this. Um, we have one eigendirection for lambda equals zero. Everything on that is going to be a fixed point. It's a bit hard to draw. If you start anywhere on that line, you just stay there forever. On the other eigendirection, let's say it's the negative one, I do tend to zero. And if I have a combination of those, have an unusual phase portrait, in which everything will just fall in towards the other axis there and then stay there. It'll land on one of those fixed points, but which one it lands on depends on the starting point.